Today's talk is the first in our new lecture series, Conversations in Forest History. We're inviting scholars and artists and industry leaders to come share their work, talk to us about how they use forest history or how they intersect with forest history. You'll find a list of upcoming presentations on the website under the education listing. Our guest today is Tim Palmer. Tim is an award-winning nature photographer and writer. His lifetime of connections to forests began with a childhood spent in the woods of the Appalachian foothills of Western Pennsylvania. In addition to his book, Twilight of the Hemlocks and Beaches, which won the Ansel Adams Photography Award and is the focus of his talk today, his other forest books include Trees and Forests of America and America's Great Forest Trails, which was published just last year. <clears throat> in all, he has 30 books. Uh, which you can find a full listing of at timpalmer.org. Tim has a background in landscape architecture, and he also worked ten, for 10 years as a land use planner. So not only has he captured uh, the, the land through his lens, but he understands the land as well in a, in a very different way, in, I'd say two different ways. In today's presentation, Tim's going to share his photos and talk about what's happening with hemlocks and beaches in the eastern United States. And so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Tim. Thank you, Jamie. It is great to be with you here. I, you know, I miss a live audience, but it's also kind of nice to, and an honor actually, to have all of you into my own living room here. And uh to hear me talk about hemlocks and beaches and their plight today and to show you the photos that I was so privileged to be able to take while I was working on this project. You know, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I live in Oregon now, here on the half a block from the coast of Oregon and the southern end of the state. But I grew up in the Appalachian foothills of Pennsylvania and hemlocks and beaches were my favorite trees as they are, I think, to so many people. And um, I was able to uh, really start photographing them seriously for an earlier book I did, which Jamie mentioned called Trees and Forests of America. Uh, and as I learned more and more about the exotic pests that are plaguing these two species, I became interested in doing a full-scale work just on those. And Penn State University Press was very interested in this. Uh, they actually published my very first book back in 1980. So it was a real pleasure to come back to work with them to, uh, to put my book together. And let me, uh, let me show you here. There we go. There's the cover. Uh, I think she was backwards for me. Uh, but anyway, you can get the drift. It's called Twilight of the Hemlocks and Beaches. And so uh, let me show you a little bit of what I was able to see as I worked on this project and share a little of, of what I learned. Let me apologize for the, the wound on my left cheek. Some of you may be wondering about this, but it's actually a heroic injury. I'm, I happen to be restoring seven acres of forest across the street from me here. And only yesterday I was pulling down an enormous mass of English ivy and little did I know, but in with it was this really stout limb from a shore pine that was being infected with these vines and down it came right on my face. So that's, that's what this is all about. The, uh, just in case you're wondering. Okay, let me get on with the program here by sharing my screen. This will take just a second. And um, let's see here. Hang on. Okay, I think we are good to go. So step into a hemlock grove. Enter another world. The hemlock effect can happen at any time. But let's choose a summer evening when the, the uh, mist settles thick with moisture after a light rain. The hemlock columns rise up toward the sky, 
the limbs arc overhead, like the ceiling of a cathedral. Like a ceiling and like a cathedral, but it's alive. At moments like that, the rest of the world disappears. If you're willing to go, to enter not just the grove, but also its welcoming spell, the forest can take you to another realm. At its foundation, lie rock, soil, moss, and invisible microbes too small for us to see. And then it extends impressively from seedlings to the height of ancient trees along our trail. With all those successful lives around me, I'm drawn back to the legacy of the blue planet. And hang on one second, I have a, a, a minor problem with my screen. Hey, Annie. Yeah, come on, come take a look here. Yeah, uh, can we move this over so I can see that? Yeah. Okay, sorry for the interruption. And we can also look forward to a future where one might expect in this wooded wonderland a lasting sense of tranquility. There in the twilight, the ancient grove seems as permanent as anything in life, and yet it's not. Most hemlocks will not be with us for long. Because of an exotic insect introduced to our continent half a century ago, half of the American hemlock forest has died, and the other half faces the same outcome. Meanwhile, a similar fate is befalling the American beach. Beaches often grow in close association with hemlocks. This magnificent forest is disappearing in our time. So let's take this opportunity to recognize the beauty and importance of these trees, to ponder their fate, and to consider the creative efforts of scientists and land managers to preserve some remnant of this forest and to hopefully restore its health and grandeur. These are among the widest ranging trees we have, spanning 23 states. Colored areas show where hemlocks grow. The highest densities here on this map are darker. And here's the similar range of the American beach. Hemlocks are found from Northern New England to the Appalachian Southern limits in Georgia. And from the coast of Maine, west to Wisconsin at Lake Superior, and on to Minnesota, where this tree might be the westernmost of all hemlocks, all eastern hemlocks, I should say. Beech trees range similarly from New England southward and even a bit farther south, east and west than the hemlocks. Unlike most trees, both do remarkably well without direct sunlight. The climax species, seedlings survive in the shade of their elders. Hemlocks create a cool refuge for life that depends on it. This includes life in our streams. Native brook trout need cold water and were once called hemlock trout, given their dependence on the shade cast by these evergreens. Our native trout thrive, especially in streams shaded by the great conifers. Deer take winter refuge in hemlock forests where the trees intercept snowfall and allow the hooved animals to move without post holing. Other wildlife take refuge here as well, including the rare Blackburnian warbler. In spring, hemlocks sprout new growth that nourishes deer, rabbits, and other wildlife. Hemlock roots grow shallow and thick, literally holding the mountains together. Beech nuts are important wildlife food. Here we see the bristly casings that hold the nuts. And here we see one of them in its shelled form. The hemlock forest offers what ecologist David Foster of the Harvard Forest called landscape diversity, 
with evergreen cover and a region dominated by deciduous trees. Here amid hardwoods, hemlocks are the trees with the pointed tops. Our cultural attachment to these trees is also profound. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow opened his epic poem, Evangeline, in a hemlock forest, immortalizing the mood that many of us feel today, writing of hemlocks indistinct in the twilight. A lifetime later, in a poem called Dust of Snow, Robert Frost recalled a moment when a hemlock branch bent and doused him with snow, giving him a welcome, quote, change of mood. Andrew Jackson Downing, America's first great landscape architect, wrote that the hemlock was, quote, the most graceful tree grown in this country. Governor Gifford Pinchot named the hemlock the official state tree of Pennsylvania in 1931. No stranger to the woods, Pinchot had served as the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service and held a special fondness for the trees of his home state. Hemlock cones are tiny and soft in comparison to those of other conifers. Seedlings take root and grow or wait for a subtle ray of sunlight to open in the canopy, and then they shoot up for the sky. They often top 100 feet in height, and a few have grown to 170, with diameters of three feet and more. As Robert Frost noted, hemlocks accommodate deep snowfalls with the ability to bend and drop the weighty load before it breaks the branches. Beaches also tower above many trees, reaching 130 feet. In spring, the beaches' new buds burst into starry patterns and then unfurl into robust young leaves and a full canopy of green in the summer. <clears throat> in autumn, the beaches turn yellow and then gold and then amber with leaves that adhere to the young trees in the winter. Hemlocks have rough corrugated bark that you see in the background of this picture here. The bark dies and splits to allow growth of the cambium beneath it. Beaches, on the other hand, are known for their elegantly smooth bark. Unlike other trees, the beech bark grows in tandem with the inside of the tree and so remains smooth. The hemlock's glossy needles resist transpiration. Twigs are packed with needles for chlorophyll, which can produce food even in warm spells through winter. Odd single needles, needles align even on top of twigs early in the year. Undersides of the needles show white lines marking stomata, which enable the tree to breathe in carbon dioxide and expel oxygen. That's exactly the opposite of what we do. These and other trees inhale what we exhale and vice versa making our relationship with them as intimate as one can imagine between two very different forms of life. Both species of trees convert atmospheric carbon dioxide into solid carbon, the essential substance of wood, and thus sequester this element in their trunks. That's exactly what we need in the age of global warming which is caused by excess carbon being pumped into the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels and cut down the large carbon sequestering trees. Large trees do this far more effectively than small ones. The ancient forest is our ally in solving the imbalance of carbon in the warming atmosphere. The remarkable evolution of the hemlock has been revealed by Dr. Nathan Havel of the U.S. Forest Service, who triangulated DNA samples, plate tectonics, and fossil records to piece together the hemlock's genetic history. From one species in the protocontinental Pangaea, the hemlock evolved on four paths as the continents separated, one in Northern Europe, one in Asia, 
one in Western North America and the other in Eastern North America. The European species went extinct with the warming climate following the last ice age. In the American West, two species evolved, the Western hemlock and at higher elevations, the mountain hemlock, both keystone species in the habitats where they live. The Eastern hemlock is the main species east of the Mississippi, while the Carolina hemlock grows on a few high peaks of the Southern Appalachians. Though typically much smaller than Eastern hemlocks, it reaches stout diameters on a few mountains in North Carolina. The movement of the continental plates protected each species from the pests and diseases affecting the others. <clears throat> An insect called the woolly adelgid preyed on the Asian species, but during tens of millions of years, insect predators evolved to eat the adelgids and the trees developed resistances of their own, leading to a balance of sorts in Asia. However, the adelgid did not surface in North America and in its absence, neither insect predators nor natural resistance to the adelgid evolved for the Eastern hemlocks. Then with unrestricted global trade, an adelgid infected Japanese hemlock was brought by boat to America in about 1950 and the great arboreal tragedy began. Too small to normally see, the adelgid produces a waxy substance that guards its egg clusters seen on the undersides of twigs in this slide, especially in winter. The adelgid inserts a needle-like feeding tube into the tiny hemlock twigs and for the rest of its life sucks out vital fluids. Here in this microscopic photo, you can see the body of the adelgid and its long feeding tube. Here you can see the advance of the adelgid within the brown outline. Putting the standard rabbit metaphor to shame, the adelgids reproduce asexually in a method called parthenogenesis. All members of the species produce young in two generations per year. They expand until consuming their food source which in this case is the free cafeteria of hemlock trees across 23 states. Slow to expand its range at first, the adelgid gained brutal growth momentum in the late 1900s. Spreading from its origins in Richmond, Virginia, it now covers over half the range of the hemlock and is expanding at seven miles per hour. On the large map, you can see the range of hemlocks in Pennsylvania. The small map shows the extent of the adelgid invasion. <clears throat> hemlocks under siege lose needles and fail to sprout new growth. This leads to a bare gray cast in the once emerald forest. The adelgids typically kill their hemlock host within a few years, though in some cases, especially in New England, the trees hang on longer. Here at Ramsey Hollow in Virginia, all the hemlocks were ghostly dead when I arrived to photograph them in 2007. And at one of the most magnificent Eastern old growth forests of all, Joyce Kilmer in North Carolina, the hemlocks are now just skeletons or have been removed as hazard trees on the trail that goes through this grove. Loss of these evergreens would be shock enough to the natural and cultural communities that have grown up around them. But their closest forest companions, the beaches, are also in a vortex of decline. The properties making the beaches smooth bowls so beautiful also makes them vulnerable. A tiny exotic insect, Cryptococcus, bores minute holes in the bark and feeds there. It produces a waxy film on the trunks. This would be scourge enough, but the big problem is a fungus, Neonectria, which invades the holes 
and feeds thoroughly on vital fluids of the beach's phloem, leading to a leprosy-like lesions and the tree's death within a few years. Within the brown outline here, you see the extent of beach bark disease, which has progressed from north to south. Most adult beaches are killed and the mature beach forest, as we know it, is disappearing across its range from north to south. The mainline advance now in Northern Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Unlike the hemlock's plate, not all, all beaches are killed. <clears throat> 5% appear to be resistant to one degree or another and fight off the fungus's fatal effects. <clears throat> Cold winters of the North restrict both adelgids and beech bark disease, but they don't eliminate the insects and fungus, which quickly regain reproductive momentum after being knocked back by frigid weather. The worst news of all here, global warming favors the exotic predators whose populations run amok in warming winters that will only get worse. In the Eastern forest, we're playing out a double bill nightmare of unrestricted global trade and uncontrolled global warming with fatal consequences to Native American life, the result. So what can be done to protect or restore these forests? First, problems of this type always get bad before they get worse and safeguards against that should be happening, but they're not. New exotic species continue to gain footholds and then accelerate within North America. The American chestnut should have been our wake up call. That keystone species of the Appalachian forest was virtually eradicated early in the 1900s. Only sapling-sized trees survive today, like the one you see here. We lost most of the American elms to Dutch elm disease. The Fraser fir was nearly exterminated by its own adelgid species in the 1980s. And white ashes are now being eliminated by the emerald ash borer. We had hoped that some hemlocks would be resistant to the adelgid, perhaps through repellents produced as terpenoids within the tree. And a stand here above the Delaware River is thought to be resistant to adelgids, otherwise killing nearby hemlocks for the past 30 years. But at best, the resistant trees are few and widely scattered. Trees can be treated effectively with the insecticide imidacloprid. Systemic, it's applied to soil or directly into the tree's bark, where it's absorbed through tissues and into the needles, where the adelgids feed and die. Treatments must be re reapplied every three to seven years. Imidacloprid is one cause of bee colony collapse. However, Bees do not pollinate hemlock trees, nor do any other insects, and so they're not endangered by its use here. Where applied to hemlocks, the pesticide remains below mammalian toxicity levels and also well below threshold levels in downstream waters. Nonetheless, chemical treatment is a stopgap measure only until longer term solutions surface. The introduction of biological predators, insects that eat adelgids in their Asian countries of origin, are hopefully the future line of defense. These tiny beetles here are feeding on adelgids. A number of species have been found, lab tested, certified as safe, and released in hemlock forest across the east. And more recently, silverflies have also been propagated from Western North America and released to prey on the adelgids. Sasaja skimnus beetles came first, then Laracobius and other species from Japan and the Pacific Northwest. Efforts here encouraging with the potential for East, East ecosystem level success uh, still unknown. 
Dr. Carol Chia, research entomologist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, has documented beneficial effects of the predators, but recognizes that more must be done and laments the lack of support to fund the necessary work, even in a state where people unconditionally love their hemlocks. Hope remains that biological controls will be successful in saving remnant populations of hemlocks, which can then be used to recolonize lost habitat. Ecologist David Orwick of the Harvard Forest has found through pollen records that hemlocks endured another bottleneck of genetic limitations about 9,000 years ago and recovered. The good news here is that hemlocks rebounded from catastrophic losses in the past. The bad news is that the recovery took 2,000 years. Choosing the best of current options, Pennsylvania's Eastern Hemlock Conservation Plan delineates a path forward and the Forest Service has embraced, the US Forest Service has embraced a similar strategy of treatment, research and introduction of the Delgid predators. And land managers are doing what they can in many areas. In the Southern Appalachians where the largest hemlocks thrived, Every one of the largest trees has died except this one, the Chioa hemlock, where arborist and native tree society founder Will Blosen first applied pesticides. Blosen calls Chia the most medicated tree on earth. In Ohio Pile State Park in Pennsylvania, state managers apply pesticides to keep 600 acres of hemlocks alive. Several thousand trees are being treated in Cook Forest State Park. The Nature Conservancy treats its Woodbourne Preserve in northeastern Pennsylvania. And 8,000 trees are treated in Savage Gulf State Park, Tennessee. Other land managers apply pesticides in refuges across the east, hoping to buy time for the biological controls to take hold. Regarding beech bark disease, Pennsylvania has had success in grafting resistant trees to native rootstock and outplanting a new generation in an effort to build on the 5% of beaches that appear resistant. One lesson in this story is that we must do whatever is possible to save a remnant of our ancient hemlock and beech forests and then restore them. But another far reaching lesson here is that we need to better care for all the native forests that remain. Fragmentation of our native forests is one of the chief causes of even greater losses. And we can do something about that. Clear cut logging causes massive erosion and soil loss. And with it, the ability of the land to produce another forest. Coal mining and gas drilling are other causes of forest fragmentation. Subdivision and land development are the largest causes of forest fragmentation across the East. Better zoning can steer new development away from remote rural areas and toward built up villages, towns and cities where public services are also more economically provided. Meanwhile, Many of the exotic vectors of disease are abetted by air pollution that weakens the tree's defenses. Air pollution can corrode the leaves, making them more vulnerable to insect and pathogens invasions, and can alter the chemistry of the soil in ways that weakens the trees. As if all this were not enough, global warming now stresses native life and gives exotic pests an advantage. While our options for controlling the adelgid are limited, we can approach many of these other problems of our forests with public action for cleaner air, reduced global warming, and healthier forests. The first rule of ecosystem survival is to save all the parts, and large protected areas are needed to do this. As Christine Johnson, forester for Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 
told me, we need to save large areas as reservoirs of great genetic and topographic diversity. Forest refuges, refuges can be built upon our existing national and state parks and forests. Pathways for wildlife migration and genetic conveyance need to be established between the protected areas. These are often corridors along streams. Even in urban areas, these can serve as valuable pathways of life and wildness. The opportunities for better care of our woodlands and our entire landscape are vast, and each and every one of us can adopt a worthy forest, stream, or extended backyard as our own. So allow yourself to not only be moved by the beauty of these woods, but also engaged in the planning and care of forests wherever we live. These woodland places are for everyone and they're important to all of us. If the dwindling delights of the hemlocks and the beaches can inspire us to do better and to address with new resolve the problems of American forests, then our debt to these remarkable trees will be even greater than it already is. So, like I said earlier, step into a hemlock grove. Do it now while you still can. These trees are the messengers. Their requirements tell us what we must do to have a healthy planet. And I might project to sustain or reconstitute healthy lives ourselves. The final message of the hemlocks and beaches is not of the past, but of the future. To honor these beloved trees, we must care better for all the native forests that remain. Thanks for sharing your time with me here this afternoon. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'll get the, there we go. Um, thanks very much. And um, I appreciate how you kind of blend poetry and science so well uh, with your writing. And so that if nothing else, it's a testimony or a testament to if, um, if you're interested in any of Tim's books, what you'll encounter in his books is some beautiful writing um, and magnificent pictures. Or really, I mean, they're more than pictures. They, they really are photos that um, could be hanging in, in art museums in many cases. Um, I have to confess what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a historian who's, I study those who study the trees is how I, I characterize a lot of what I do. And my familiarity with the American beach is from trail running or hiking. And the beach the, um, is, I guess, renowned or notorious for having the exposed roots <clears throat> that, um, that, you know, we, we've come to, we who run trails, tend to call the, the American beach the, the bane of trail runners existence because you end up getting your feet tangled up in them if they're right along the uh, um, right along a riverbed and stuff. But now I'm going to be looking at beaches and hemlocks with a, a, a more positive frame of mind and, and remembering that they're they're more endangered than I am when I'm moving through the woods. So we have a, a couple of questions. Walt Freebull Tim wants to know what type of forestry safety equipment do you regularly use for protection while working in the woods? <laughs> Is this in regard to my injury? <laughs> it, it must be. I, uh, you know, I don't wear safety equipment much. The uh, where I'm working has a uh, a lot of ivy and a lot of English holly, which is. Uh, can be toxic to your skin. So I wear heavy duty clothes, uh, but I didn't have any face protection or eye protection, which uh, was probably a mistake yesterday. If this is in regard to pesticides, you know, like applying the imidacloprid, 
of course, precautions need to be taken there and that work needs to be done by people who are well-informed and, and at a big scale, certainly by a professional. And I, you know, I can't really speak to that. Okay, but, <clears throat> and maybe Walt's hinting at or wanting to know if you're to, and I'm curious about this as well, with some of your photos, are you climbing up into trees? And maybe that's part of the safety <laughs> equipment question, or are you simply working on the, literally on the ground? No, no I do both. That's, that's a very uh, interesting uh, observation because I love getting the view down into the forest as well. And, you know, all those perspectives from very low at the ground level, you know, from the roots up and from the crown down. And so, yes, I do climb trees to take photos. And, and actually, I love to climb trees. I all, ever since I was four years old, I've loved to climb trees. And uh, getting good pictures gives me an excuse to do that, that childhood pursuit as an adult. <laughs> But are you, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but are you doing kind of free climbing or are you using equipment oh, that? No, 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 I'm just, I just free climb. Okay. I just free climb. Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't really done the, uh, you know, the big scale climbing of Northwestern trees, although they are here. But uh, no, I haven't quite got that far along yet. <laughs> I understand. So Steve <laughs> Rudnick, <clears throat> And is asking, what are we doing here, <laughs> excuse me, in the Southwest to combat the pine bark beetle? Do you know anything about that, Tim? Well, I know it's an enormous problem, uh, but, you know, I am not familiar with solutions. To, you know, the pine bark uh, beetle, I, as I understand, is a native, um, you know, and it's, we're just Unfortunately, we're going to see massive ecosystem level changes with insects and, and pathogens uh, because of global warming. You know, it's, we've had a 20 year drought in the Southwest and it's just hard to deal with that. And drought, of course, is going to be becoming more and more common with global warming. So we are definitely going to see uh, changes in entire ecosystems because of that. By the way, let me, I know there's some, uh, some really well-qualified experts on, on these questions who have also tuned in. So if any of you out there can add to the, uh, to the answers I'm giving here, like, you know, I don't have direct experience with pine bark beetles. Please uh, drop a line, what, in the chat box, James? J uh, Jamie, actually, or question and the, answer um, would be preferred. Question. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, please help me out if you can. <clears throat> and and that's, this is one of the challenges is, of course, um, for you, Tim, is that you've, you spent obviously a great deal of time in the hemlock and beech ecosystems of the East. And you've obviously delved deep into the, the research and the science. So uh, I appreciate Steve's question, <clears throat> but I also appreciate that it's a little bit outside your bailiwick. Um, now, one of the, Photos that struck me uh, is the what uh, are often now being called ghost forests, where you know it's a, a forest that has been just devastated by whatever the invasive is. And so Dale uh, is <clears throat> asking, are those ghost forests prone to wild? Excuse me, to wildfire. Do you know anything about that, Tim? Well, yes, they are, but. Uh... But all forests are in today's climatic extremes. So of course the dead trees burn, but live trees burn too. And in fact, what burns the hottest in like, like gasoline out here are the immature monocultures, you know, the plantation forests that have taken place where we've had commercial clear cutting with trees that are of like four to 40 years old they are incendiary. I mean, that's, that's where we have the hottest fires, the least controllable fires. So, uh, you know, yes, the dead trees burn, but the, uh, but the live ones do too. In fact, you know, there's quite a bit of evidence that they burn even faster, even hotter, and even less controllably. Hmm. I was not aware of that. Uh, 
<clears throat> Sam Somerville asks, are Western and mountain hemlocks also susceptible to the woolly adelgid? Boy, so far, you know, fingers crossed. Oh, excuse me, fingers crossed the, <laughs> uh, you know, we're doing okay. The Western hemlocks seem to be, as I mentioned in the show, uh, to be allied either with native insects that eat adelgids and or, and most likely, or resistance to the pests. Although, um, you know, I'm not sure, and other experts I've talked to are not totally sure if, uh, what would happen if the exposure were more extreme. It's scary to think about bringing, uh, you know, a lot of Eastern woolly adelgids and dropping them into a Western hemlock forest. Although in experiments, the Western forests have been shown to resist that. So, like I said, fingers crossed, our Western species are doing well, which probably owes to them being clo more closely genetically aligned. Do you remember Dr. Nathan Havel's work on the, you know, Pangea and the, and the evolution of the four different groups and all that? The Western hemlocks may be more closely aligned genetically to the Asian species. Uh, at any rate, Western trees are still doing well and, uh, but boy, you know, every time I step outside here, I've got, I've got Western hemlocks right outside the door. You know, I take a kind of take a big sigh and, and hope that, uh, that, hope that they keep doing well. Yeah, let's hope that uh, whatever is holding back the, that which is plaguing the Eastern forests is, is going to stay in place and, and yeah, you will just keep it contained. A little sidelight there too, and maybe someone can can add to this for me. Uh, but the success of the West, our own Western uh, U.S. hemlock species, may include some of the answers we need to dealing with our Eastern hemlock experience. I mentioned silverflies that are now being introduced in the East. Some of those are coming from Western U.S. and the uh, the Laracobius uh, beetles. Uh, came, as I understand it, from Western U.S. And somehow it just seems a little more appropriate to get West predators from the Western U.S., even though they're not native to Eastern U.S., but somehow it seems just a little bit safer or more re reasonable to do that than, you know, going to Asia to get them. So, the, you know, the success of our Western hemlocks may contribute to the ultimate salvation of our Eastern trees as well. Yeah, it, it does make me nervous that we're importing a solution to a problem that we imported. I know, um, and you know, I, had I, a hard am not, time. I am not at all uh, steeped in the science, but it just, it's, it's a gut feeling like this is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they, you know, there have been miserable experiments in introductions. Uh, the worst one's kind of dealing with vertebrates though, like nutrias. But uh, it kind of did give me the creeps at first to know that we were bringing in insects from Asia. However, I became convinced by the scientists dealing with this that the testing protocols are quite uh, adequate. They're extensive. You know, there's a lot of testing. It's usually done over a period of years in extremely controlled situations. And then the outplanting is you know, done cautiously, at least at first. And thus far, and uh, we have been out planting like the Sasaja skimness beetles for many years now. And as I mentioned, Dr. Chia in, uh, in Connecticut has found success that way and, and not any problems of them just kind of running amok themselves. So <clears throat> Gary Schneider asks, has anyone done any work on soil amendments, whether nutrients or fungi? to combat diseases <clears throat> and even insect infestations. Yes, and do not add nutrients or fertilizer to your hemlocks, hoping you will strengthen them to combat the adelgid invasion. That only makes, seems to make matters worse. Hmm. So actually that's one thing that you should definitely not do. Uh, other amendments, no, I've never heard of anything like that. Of course, the imidacloprid is a pesticide can be introduced into the soil or into the bark itself in liquid form. But amendments to actually give, to fortify the tree, I've never heard of anything, um, 
that's worked. Actually, I haven't really heard of anything that's been tried, except for fertilizer, which had a negative effect. It benefited the adelgids more than the trees. Okay. I, uh, I apologize. I'm also looking to see if any of our uh, experts who have tuned in are could supplement answers, but that doesn't. Yeah, yeah, I would certainly welcome that. <clears throat> that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so, Tom Rogers, wait, uh, are you aware of, asks, are you aware of small uh, landholders treating hemlocks? Oh, yeah, yeah. My sister does it in Charlottesville. <laughs> in and she has three she has three trees, yeah. Mm -hmm. So definitely you can you can get you can buy a metacloprid in the store and uh, follow the directions, carefully apply it. Uh, thousands of landowners do that. And that is actually a good solution to saving your hemlock trees in the yard or wherever you are. And uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of that. I mean, I hate pesticides as much as anyone, but in this case, you know, where the, the bees are not getting into it, the, uh, the external effects seem to be nominal, uh, not with other uses of the metacloprid. Metacloprid is one of the most commonly used pesticides in America. It's applied by crop dusters in the West in gross quantities that do cause problems and that do impact bee colonies. But its use on hemlocks and especially in a home scene don't use it on your uh, your florals, you know, your shrubbery and your tulips and whatever. But because uh, bees go to those, mm -hmm. but for your hemlock trees, careful application is a fine way, the only way, for the time being, to save your hemlocks. And we're just hoping that if we can hang on to them long enough, that the biological predators will take hold and that will ultimately have ecosystem-wide changes so that we, because obviously we can't do pesticides forever. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so Michael asks a question about the um, cold temperatures. And it's rather timely given the, uh, the, the winter storms that have been kind of battering the East Coast here. But he asks, how effective are cold temperatures at thwarting the, the HWA? It, he understands that 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit is the key number. But if it kills 97%, <coughs> excuse me, of the HWA, it's just a, just a selective pressure that forces uh, the adelgid to adapt to cold temperatures. I'm not sure if he's speculating or... No, there is evidence of that. Okay. There is evidence. The cold definitely helps. 20 below is great, but even less than that helps. The colder, the better. Uh, you know, it's not a matter of snow, it's a matter of temperature. So, you know, we just hope for cold spells now and, you know, big Arctic air blasts, which can still happen even with global warming because global warming causes the jet stream to move and that can actually bring really cold Arctic air southward when it might not have come before. So we really want that. It really does help. I have heard of 20 below being kind of a figure where you get a significant loss. However, it's never total. And uh, so, you know, and within the number I've heard is three years, th 3% survival in three years can be back up to a massive carrying capacity of adelgids. So it buys us time, as Dr. Chia in Connecticut has, has told me, but it doesn't really solve the problem. And it's, yeah, and for much of the the range, if you were to look at that map, uh, I'll just point out like <clears throat> North South Carolina, we're not ever seeing temperatures Can't that low in, in the mountains. That's why, as Will Blosen told me, you know, all those giant trees, which were the biggest ones ever, because they grew bigger in the South where the growing season is longer and all that, you know, they're gone except for the, the one tree. Mm. And, um, in New England, we still have a lot of hemlocks. They're impact, many of them are impacted by the adelgid, but they're hanging on because every now and then they get that cold year that buys them more time. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can buy time enough to come to a solution. 
it, we, we could face a future where the only remaining hemlocks are in Canada. You know, welcome to our Canadian guests here in this program. Yeah, we may, you know, I may need a visa to see a hemlock tree, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or the next generation here may, uh, and the very far west, you know, there are hemlocks in the upper peninsula of Michigan, Porcupine Mountain State Park. As I mentioned, the very westernmost in Minnesota, just barely into Minnesota, south of Duluth, has the, uh, the westernmost trees of all. Hopefully the adelgid will be longer getting to there and the colder winters there should help as well. So, well, speaking of uh, Canadian, uh, going to Canada to visit or see hemlocks, <clears throat> Mark asks, that, or he says, I've heard that Eastern hemlock is, excuse me, also referred to as the Canadian hemlock. Are they the same yeah. species? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Suga canadensis is really the name, you know. It's named for Canada, even though they thrived in Alabama. But yes, same species. Eastern hemlock is the Canadian hemlock. <clears throat> Arthur Cooper um, talks about the beech bark disease. Um, <clears throat> and he's wondering if there's evidence that the southern beech might have some resistance to bark disease. You know, I what I have read about this is that originally there were hopes in that regard, but they, they seem not to be bearing out. And again, someone else might have better up-to-date information on this than I do. But my impression is, uh, from what I've seen, no. And uh, of course, the disease is later getting there. Beach bark disease actually started in Halifax, Nova Scotia hmm. in about 1890 with a very slow momentum, you know, getting into Maine and then speeding up and wherever firewood or worse nursery stock was imported, you know, we have this spun, the leapfrogging, sometimes, sometimes leapfrogging hundreds of miles to where a, a node of infestation will begin again. But, uh, but just the geography has meant that it's longer and slower getting to the South my, from what I've heard, it's the, the southern beech trees are and will remain susceptible and plagued by it. Again, if there's new, better news on this, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Sure. Uh, Dave Gavatsky, who I know <clears throat> is up in uh, New Hampshire, is asking, uh, what about the, the Carolina hemlock? Is it, so, is, is it similar to what is happening to the eastern hemlock? Yeah, the Carolina hemlock seemed to be affected also, and uh, <clears throat> perhaps not as much. I mean, there aren't very many Carolina hemlocks. Yeah, you know, they only populate certain very small areas, high elevation of peaks in the southern Appalachians, like North Carolina. I had a photo of one that was uh, that Will Blosen showed me. It was probably uh, might have been 18 inches in diameter, or, or at least 12 which is big for a Carolina hemlock. Uh, and, uh, but my understanding is they are susceptible to the disease also, but perhaps not as much because there are still some there. Okay. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> an anonymous attendee who, uh, I'm gonna help plug a little something for them, but he says we've gained tremendous amounts of or her uh, we've gained tremendous amounts of private management assistance from forestry seminar programs at the New York State Wood Woodsman's Field Days at the Oneida County Fairgrounds in Boonville, New York. Um, apparently, this is, they'll be celebrating their, the Woodsman's Field Days in August of this year. It'll be their 75th anniversary. <clears throat> My question then, I'll, I'll take this to ask if you know anything about extension, state like state extension or county extension programs or efforts at the state level, uh, it's easy for us to focus on the US Forest Service for obvious reasons. I'm wondering if you could shed any light on what's happening with state agencies or county agencies. Yeah, I think they, I think within the range of the problem here, they are all familiar and versed with this and prepared to recommend uh, homeowner and small landowner solutions like how to safely and properly apply a midicloprid. 
as far as research and you know bigger picture work, I, I'm not familiar with that. The uh, some some state agricultural experiment stations, uh, such as that of Carochia in in Connecticut, have been very active. But I think at any county extension service people there know about this problem and can help you. Yeah, it's it, they're not unfamiliar with it. Right. Uh, that, that's for sure. Right. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned, I think it's the, the Adelgid that's moving at seven miles an hour. Seven miles per year. Seven miles per year. Okay. I was like, yeah. So of course that's hour. spotty. That's spotty, right. of course. You know, that's an average, you know. Yeah, it, it depends on what car, kind of car they're driving, maybe, I don't know. Totally. Um, but uh, somebody wants to know uh, if there are any calculations or expectations as to when the Adelgid would start showing up in the Eastern Hemlocks, Western range of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula. So the, the Upper Midwest, um, do you know anything about, about that? I don't. I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if it's already there. Uh, my experience there is I didn't see any, uh, but, you know, it could easily jump there. And again, if someone from those states can help me here, I'm sure people know way more about that than I do. The, I kind of looked for the Western limit of what was obvious to me as a photographer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, I mentioned before, I grew up in the Appalachian foothills, Beaver, Pennsylvania. McConnell's Mill State Park was my backyard wonderland when I grew up in Cook Forest. Cook Forest is plagued by a delegate. Fortunately, the state park there, Dale Luthinger and others, I'm not sure if that was that Dale that, that made the question earlier. If it is, hello, Dale. <laughs> but he and others at, at Cook Forest State Park have worked really hard applying imidacloprid responsibly to, uh, I think, like 8,000 trees. It's a magnificent grove. It's the best uh, single chemlock grove we have. And, uh, but it has the adelgids nearby, only uh, like 60 miles away was McConnell's Mill State Park. I didn't see any of it there uh, as of a couple of years ago. It may be there now and Little Beaver State Park just into Ohio, just west of Pennsylvania. I saw no evidence of it. Uh, but again, it might be there by now also. It seems pretty much inevitable. I mean, it certainly jumped to the Western divide of the Mississippi, you know, in the Ohio mm -hmm. basin and all that, in the Tennessee basin, big time. But, uh, you know, to the far Northern Midwest, don't know. Again, fingers crossed that the cold and the distance will at least buy some time there. I, I fear that you're right, that it is simply a matter of time. Um, right. You know, moving firewood and, and just the, these acts of, we enable it, we assist it, uh, whatever the, the disease or insect is uh, through our own actions and short-sightedness at times. Um, but that's, I appreciate that that question a lot. So Ed Forster just gives us something to think about. And if you wish to respond, please do. <clears throat> he says, many of our troublesome forest diseases and insects have been in imported and most have really won the day so far. Perhaps we need to look at things on a geological time scale rather than, if you will, on a stopwatch. So we tend to think of things in, in a time scale that matches our lifetimes or less. <clears throat> is how I'm, that's kind of my take on what Ed is saying. And, but he's asking or suggesting that maybe we should be thinking about this on a larger, longer time scale. I think mm -hmm. he mentioned there was, there was something about, you. I, I heard the figure or recall you mentioning the figure of 2000 years before the tree came back. Um, actually, if you could just kind of touch on that again and maybe talk about the, the time scale that um, yeah, David Orwig at the Harvard Forest is the one that uncovered this, this uh, history, amazing history that the Hemlocks went through this before, but it took thousands of years for them to recover. The amazing, they didn't go extinct. Of course, the European species did go extinct after the last ice age. 
uh, owing, you know, near as we know, not to any exotic predator, but just to climate change, which of course is the mm. scariest thing of all. But the, um, yeah, the super long-term, you know, it's hard to wrap your head around that. There are obviously gonna be global changes in ecosystem as one of my great friends who works hard to eradicate exotic weeds uh, in, in the, on the coast of California says, we're losing the war of the weeds. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully we can maintain some refugia where we do keep these exotics out, like our state parks, like our national parks, you know, national forests would be great. And hopefully we'll maintain some places intact with the, the, the native assemblage intact that can, then, that can serve as a building block for the future if we ever really solve the problem. But in the super long term, yeah, it just seems we're gonna have massive ecological changes and not for the better. And even though it's inevitable, I, you know, I for one, I'm not willing to give up. I mean, let's, let's do what we can to champion the native species we have and give them as much time as possible. And hopefully there will even be evolutionary changes with them as there probably were with the Eastern Hemlock 9,000 years ago uh, to slowly adapt and evolve. But unfortunately that means going through the hourglass of extinction where you get down to very small populations that are resistant. Uh, they could easily wink out, but hopefully they won't and we'll be able to, to have them expand once again if they can develop natural resistance, or if we can cleverly alter the ecosystem enough to again benefit them, such as what we're trying to do by introduction of the exotic beetles that eat the adelgids. I take, you know, it's inevitable. I take little satisfaction though in knowing that, you know, at some point a whole new ecosystem will be here. And, you know, if there are people around, it might be regarded just as beautiful as we do today. But of course, today we know what is being lost and it's heartbreaking to see that. Stuart Moskowitz asks a really interesting question, which is he, he notes that Suzanne Simard's recent book, Finding the Mother Tree, uh, her research shows that trees talk with each other and across species. And as I understand it, they, they found evidence of trees helping one another, pushing nutrients or uh, other, you know, and communicating through the root systems and through the, the ground. <clears throat> and he wants to know if, if there's any evidence of beaches and hemlocks commuting, communicating with each other and assisting one another in that way. You know, I can't, I don't know. I can't answer that. We do know that 5% of the beaches to one degree or another are resistant. You know, some quite a bit and some of that 5%, not so much. Uh, can they communicate and, and release, you know, chemicals that help them, all that? I don't know. I'm kind of working against that line. It seems that hemlocks growing more individually in the Smoky Mountains have done better than those in groves where they're all together. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of imagine it as, you know, a, uh, a super spreader COVID event. You know, the same phenomenon I'm sure applies. So in, you know, in that sense, is it's better to be isolated and alone. And I make a little pilgrimage to an American chestnut tree that is four feet in diameter in the city of Portland, Oregon, hmm. 3,000 miles from native habitat. It's isolated and it survived. There, there may well be this other phenomenon of trees helping each other and sharing through their nutrients and microbes and fungi and all that, because mm -hmm. uh, we know that happens, uh, whether, it, whether that can help us in these two situations, I don't know, but I haven't seen anything that indicates that it would. It's, it's hard to imagine that they would stand up to the onslaught. So we yeah. have- However, uh, if, excuse me. Yeah, no, go ahead. But if there is natural resistance, 
And we think that there is a, perhaps a little bit like that Delaware Grove I was talking to you about, you know, we, the scientists up there really th thought, think, or at least thought that, uh, that they had some resistance, then this phenomenon could perhaps apply there. Okay, two more, and then uh, we'll, we'll finish up. <clears throat> Thank you for staying on um, this long. Hugh, Hugh Canham asks, what are the similarities between European beach and our native beach? And is European beach affected by beach bark disease? You know, the disease came from Europe, uh, and yet the European beaches were didn't go extinct. Uh, I don't know really the answer to that, but it would make sense that the European beaches have better resistance than our American beaches do because uh, the disease came from there and then has decimated our beaches. Uh, but I don't, whether they're affected at all uh, or to what degree, uh, sorry, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Caroline Karp says, great talk. Uh, what are some of the more resilient <laughs> successional species in New England hem hemlock and beech forests given the pests and climate change? So I think I coughed right over her question. <clears throat> what are some of the more resilient successional species in New England's hemlock and beech forests given the pests and climate change issues there or challenges? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, but I would say where we have hemlocks in New England in the coldest pockets of climate, you know, those would be the ones that are doing the best. And also those that are being treated uh, with pesticide or with predators, uh, you know, like the, like the beetles uh, that are being released, you know, those would be the ones that, that are doing better. Uh, you know, I went to photograph hemlocks as far north as I could go. I, I went to Bar Harbor to Acadia National Park. They were not up there yet, but they were not that far away in other parks on the coast of Southern Maine uh, that I photographed for the book. So, um, you know, so there are pockets that are still unaffected and even within areas that are affected such as Southern Connecticut. There, there are micro pockets that are doing better than others, probably because of microclimate. Okay. Well, Tim, thanks again. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Just a reminder, folks, that you can find all of Tim's books and learn more about him on his website, timpalmer.org. <clears throat> um, just, uh, again, author of 30 books and counting. And each one of them is just, um, especially during these times of uh, self-isolation and, and quarantining, uh, to delve into any of his books is a nice escape, uh, a nice visual trip uh, outside your house without ever leaving your couch or, or comfy chair. <laughs> Jamie, let me, let me uh, in that regard, let me make another shameless announcement of sure. my most recent book, which is uh, you know, much more delightful and hopeful in its, in its message. It's called America's Great Forest Trails, published by a, a big, beautiful art book publisher, Rizzoli. Uh, and it's, uh, it came out just this past fall. And in terms of, you know, sitting down in these days and uh, paging through a little wish list of beautiful forests, many of which are probably near you, uh, take a look. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, this was uh, what Tim was talking about today. This book is also from, oh, this one's from, <clears throat> excuse me, Penn State University Press. So hats off to them for doing that. Um, I know from publishing that it's not, those books are not inexpensive to produce. So, um, and just a reminder, really, to any anyone, please order directly from the publisher or from your local bookstore. Um, it's, up to, it's up to us to keep them going. Uh, I know you might find it for less on Amazon, but they're not helping us. Uh, they're not helping us stay in business as publishers, and they're not helping authors uh, 
sustain themselves and, and get, in Tim's case, to, to afford to go back out and, and capture more of, of our beautiful forests and waterways and, and, and hiking trails and all of that. So there's, there's the, the, the shameless plug for support your local bookstore as best you can, if it, if it is at all reasonable. Um, <clears throat> Tim, once again, thank you. Tim's website, timpalmer.org. And again, please support your, your local nature photographer <laughs> and, and others. Um, really appreciate your time. Tim, and thank you all for uh, tuning in, staying tuned in, and asking such great questions. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you, Jamie, and thanks for all that you do. Thank you. I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, and we'll mm -hmm. see you next month. Bye-bye.